spleen. So, okay. Yeah, that's so right. extra spleen. That's something you didn't know, right? If you knew that, then I'm, <laughs> or you might not. Does it make you better at like hearing things? Or? No, not at all. It's just a different. Clearly, language. it doesn't. <laughs> Spleen a mess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Cameron, aka Golden Sounds. Uh, when I was a couple weeks old, I was diagnosed as being British, and I've struggled with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Descended Testicle. What? Oh, my <laughs> name is Steve. Uh, I'm Z Reviews, or Z Osperatera. I also run the Eater Fetish channel, and the Z Unboxing channel, the Z Cooks channel, and the Hi Fi for Hi Fi Guides forums with you. Yep. Although we really, we're, we're not taking care of our baby. We should probably update We're going to take stuff. care of our baby at some point. It's but if you need a forum that's, uh, okay. It's just okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You come to uh, Hi Fi Guides. Um, so who we're handing this to? Zach, are you, you the Yeah, man? yeah, I, I was supposed to moderate, but I don't know. Um, so I'll start you guys off with one question, and then you guys think of your questions, and I'll, I'll work my way around. If you guys don't ask enough questions, I'll just come and accost you with a microphone, and you can give me some thoughts or something. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, we're at Can Jam. We're all here to discover new gear. Um, it doesn't have to be a Can Jam related thing, but is there anything that you guys have gotten in lately that is on your mind, you can't stop thinking about, you want to go listen to it, something new that you want to talk about? So let's just go down and start with Critical uh, and just share with us what you're excited about for, for gear lately. Yeah, and uh, also, uh, 45 seconds each. We only have an hour. So, you know, once you start going, I'll, I'll come and, you know, hit the timer clock on you. I'm trying to think because. Um, in terms of gear, I think what I was excited about was actually the Exo uh, Grell's uh, new, uh, what was it, AOE 1 or whatever it was. AOE 1, AOE. Yeah, so that, that, that was very interesting. Uh, it seemed to me like an evolution of the HD 800. I've tried it. I will reserve my comments for a future for future content. But yeah, that was something I was interested in, and I heard it, and it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, I would have said that I was most excited to get the uh, High Senior Mega Fest in. But I, I was supposed to be on that loner tour, that tour, it was going around, making around, and then somebody decided to buy it. So I Who would have done that? I didn't get a chance to, so uh, scratch that one off the list. Uh, but I was pleasantly surprised, I, well, happy with the uh, uh, DCA E3 I heard at the show. and. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. So that's kind what of was cool. the first one? High senior. What is the high senior mega fest? That's not. I don't know. Oh. What is what? Yeah. What? I don't know it's what that idea. is. I need to yeah. explain. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let DMS. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing I'm most excited about is the high senior mega fest. <laughs> and that, it was and that on is, a review tour, and uh, I said, "Can I buy this?" And they said, "Sure." And now he didn't get to try it. So there's the other half of that exact same story. Um, it's an IEM that I am extremely excited about. I cannot stop listening to it. Yesterday after the show, today after the show, I'm just listening to it nonstop. Um, it's the only IEM I've ever had where everything sounded like 100% completely natural and I don't get a link mode resonance. Just, just when you put an IEM in your ear, you're creating a room, right? Your ear canal becomes a room and the speaker and your eardrum is essentially you. Um, and every room has a mode. So at some point, there's gonna be a resonance in your ear canal. It's the only item I've never had that resonance with the Audible, which is just yes, love it. And you can try mine at some point. Yeah. Can you say the name slowly? Oh, so it's spelled really weird, but if you type in M-E-G-A, the number five, a dash, and then E-S-T, okay. it comes up. We call quality. it Mega Fest, but it's okay. Mega 5 E-S-T. That's quality marketing there. Yeah, really, I don't know why things in audio are named the way they are. Like the, the old One social headphones, like, ah, uh, yes, have so you heard the MDR uh, CD900ST? Actually, that is a Sony headphone. It is, it's a really good one, but I don't know why they name them that way. It's the same with everything you copy. <laughs> anyway, Cameron's right. Oh, the Honor Screen Group. Yes. Uh, I was excited to get the Felix Envy 25th Anniversary Edition in. I was a little bit more mixed on the original Envy, and this one basically fixed all the problems I had with it, and did some interesting objective stuff. It's one of the lowest noise tube amps I've ever tested, and has the best channel matching of any tube, or any amp using a potentiometer that I've tested. So it's wildly expensive, and I'll never be able to afford one, but for the kind of person that does, it's just got all And they gave you two days with it, right? I uh, had, yeah, basically a few days with it. <laughs> what, trying to make a video. what about the wand, the wand, the wand? I don't want my own thing. <laughs> uh, I've also got my own deck, which is uh, launching here, which I'm quite excited about, but I won't uh, talk too much about that. I won't talk about my co op head either. That's the way it's going to work. I'm not talking about the errors. No, don't talk about There's a couple of them. What is he going to talk about? Base Zeos? No. 
Yes. <laughs> um, so the question was, what are we excited about? And that you're talking about at the show or just in general in audio? No, I know you guys year? are getting lots of new gear and that, you know, being at the show, everybody's walking up to you every five minutes because they know you guys really well. So it can be anything in the last, you know, month that has excited you, you want to get back to, you're right. excited to do a review. This is probably recency bias, but I had a 330 with the new Audio-Technica $108,000 oh, yeah. tube thing. And um, what headphones did you use on it? Uh, we started with the normal headphones and I put on the Prodigy because Diesel Power is a great song. And it somehow sounded like uh, Diana Krall was playing the Prodigy. Like that's how <laughs> soft and warm and smooth it was. And then uh, after a couple songs of that, we verified it was great. And then I put KPH 40 on it because costs, you gotta go <laughs> KPH 40. And it's the best they've ever sounded. And then um, through very much fear, I had a friend who brought the tungstens. I think the single sided. And I am distraught. I stood there almost crying to some Kevin Pankins. So whatever the hell that amplifier is doing is, it, it, the amplifier is worth it. The headphones, you could probably get some DMS. We, we need to get the, the 25th anniversary Felix next to it and have a shootout going. <laughs> I, I, think, I think a fight is what's worth it. But it, it's, it's definitely an impressive thing, an impressive piece. So what, you want me to continue and then move over or what? Well, we can see if any, does anyone have a question yet or should we just let Z keep going? Or? No, any qu we got a question here, great, sure. fantastic. Just curious whether any of the panelists have listened to spatial audio on the Apple Vision Pro, and I want to get your thoughts generally on spatial audio. Do you view it as another passing fad like MQA, or do you think that it's got some traction? I'm always of the opinion that DSP is always a net good for audio. I, I, I don't believe in the whole like, oh, analog or nothing, right? So spatial audio, in all of its forms, whether good or bad, is always something to strive for. So, uh, of course, we had Dolby Atmos, now we have Apple uh, Spatial Audio, uh, which is not something that I have very extensive experience on because I'm an Android boy. But from what I've heard so far, it is pretty good. And I've, I've heard on the grapevine as well that um, Apple is paying uh, artists and mixing studios to actually mix for spatial audio specifically. So that's an, an additional layer that you don't have to guesstimate for anymore. So I think it is going to get better mm -hmm. and um, not sure if it's good that Apple is at the forefront, but it is, I feel, superior and we should be doing more of it, definitely. Of all the new and exciting technologies that have come out in recent times, VR is by far the one that I am the least excited about. Oh, wow. I do not give a shit about VR. However, the spatial audio side of things is very fascinating to me. And I think that's the frontier that everybody in, in audio is kind of trying to push for, at least for these big you know, tech companies. And I think Apple's probably going to be, hopefully, yeah, doing something amazing with that. So I'm very interested in that side of it, absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, so I tried the Apple Vision Pro um, press ring kit with the AirPods Pro, which the AirPods Pro 2 with the USB-C connector is the only way to get spatial audio on the Vision Pro. It's so basically the exact same sort of spatial audio computational kind of sound that you're getting on an iPhone with the AirPods Pros. Um, but it is actually really cool. I think that the compatibility with Atmos on it is sick. The big thing is, is a lot of people have varying experiences on it, and it seems to come down to what they're listening to. You know, a lot of people, when I hear them say that Atmos and Spatial Audio is amazing, they've heard a really, really good mix. Something that's just done perfectly. And a lot of people I know who have said, wow, Atmos and Spatial Audio sucked, heard a really, really bad mix. And they show it to me, I'm like, wow, yeah, this doesn't sound good at all. So it's something that's so new that the quality still varies wildly. But when it's done right, you know, I've gone to a lot of friends that said it sucked, and they'll listen to a really good recording, and like, this is, this is excellent, I'm in the room. It takes localization from in your head, puts it out of your head. But, but you're <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. But it's still so much in its infancy that until we really start, because think about how long just regular studios were using two channel monitors. Like, that's been a long time, right? People have been using two channel monitors in studios for way longer than my lifetime, longer than double my lifetime. And it took, gosh, 40, 50 years of doing that before we got to where mixes are today. You know, they progressed so much and changed so much. We went through the loudness wars and then things are going back down again. All this stuff through just two channel. So with that said, and with that in mind, how long that took, I think we're gonna have to go through a lot of that with spatial audio before it gets to be really, really uniform. 
but I see a lot of promise in it, and I do think that it is the future of audio, but we just have a long ways until it's the standard rather than just the future. Just to be clear, you can get spatial audio on the Vision Pro itself with their built-in speakers. The yes. AirPods Pro 2 will, I guess, you know, receive lossless audio from the, from the Pro. But my experience with spatial audio through connected headphones is still very different than just mm -hmm. through the, the pods that aim audio at you. I don't know whether right. it's as a result of head-related transfer processing or it's just the fact that the the audio is being aimed at you from maybe speakers rather than directly in your Could ear. Be. I don't know. It very likely is, and I'll go on a short tangent here and then I'll pass it to the next. Um, there is an old headphone, it's very odd. It looks like two golf balls suspended in the air on either side of your head. The Sony PFRV1, yeah. And now it was a headset they made to go with a DVD player that was meant to be portable, that was a uh, mobile home theater. And it had a similar effect, it wasn't spatial audio, but it gave this holographic image outside of your head. And it's another case where you're looking at a driver projecting sound of the ear. Um, there is a lot to be said about a low acoustic impedance environment. So something where your ear is not very encapsulated. You get more consistent results from head to head. So like an HD100S is gonna be more consistently measuring head to head than something that's totally closed back. And the same applies more so with something that is an open-air headphone. So it does have to do with the acoustic impedance, how it's interacting with your HRTF, and the same thing probably applies to spatial audio, since that's essentially a simulated HRTF average applied over your own. You have like antenna in front of you, the speaker's on the way at you. Yes. That's the future. Camera <laughs> uh, My thoughts on spatial audio stuff are, uh, well, it's an area that I'm very interested in. VR is something I'm quite enthusiastic about. I was on the original Kickstarter for the Oculus. Um, the, the thing that people don't sort of tend to realize though is that one of the reasons VR audio, in fact the main reason why VR audio is so good in terms of spatial uh, representation is it has head tracking. And that's something which you can't replicate uh, usually with regular headphones unless you have that. There are some products like the AirPods Pro, uh, the Odyssey Maxwell, which have head tracking capability. And so Dolby Atmos and stuff makes complete sense for those products. Dolby Atmos for a standard stereo headphone with no head tracking does not make sense. I think that there's some stuff you could do to improve spatial uh, presentation. Uh, some people like, you know, break across feet and stuff. I developed something actually for the DAC that we just released, which is designed to sort of enhance sound stage, but you just cannot do the same kind of things uh, with a static stereo representation that you can do with head tracking. Um, and it's the same with speakers. I mean, with Atmos, obviously, when you turn your head, the speakers are moving in relation to your head, and so you get all of those changes. Um, so I think that actually for a lot of products, having Dolby Atmos implementation is kind of a bit of just marketing fluff and doesn't make sense. There is no reason why you couldn't just have the exact same audio in a differently mixed or better mixed or whatever stereo track, you know, binaural recordings and things, for instance. Um, but my hope is that in future, there will be more products either just as part of the headphones or maybe as a sort of standalone processor thing. Um, that you I can, can actually speak up on to that. Okay, yeah, that, um, that will then allow you to actually take advantage of Dolby Atmos. Until that happens, I'm pretty skeptical on it. It's really cool tech though, it's just that you have to have the head tracking or else you are massively bottlenecked. So, about head tracking, so we're all talking about Apple Vision and the, the newest modern thing. I can go back and say how I think the Valve Index headset is probably one of the... I haven't done the, the new Apple, but I know the Valve Index on its own, if you've just played music through it to a point where you're locked, is fantastic. And on to the saying you can't do head tracking with it, um, in 2016 or 17, a company named Wave NX or Waves MX mm -hmm. made a Bluetooth tracker that you attach to any headphone. And I can tell you that a pair of Stax L700s with head tracking um, was probably one of the most incredible things ever and I just couldn't sell it to anyone. It was like, hey, this, and everyone was looking at me like a person with six heads. And um, they had, well, the problem was they had an app which you could put on your phone so you could walk around and then with your headphones and then if you turned, the music would stay focused and then slowly sort of catch up to you, which I thought was really interesting, but not like groundbreaking. Then the PC app for the Waves and X would do exactly what you're talking about, where like if I play on the doors, everyone who listens to the doors knows that they are usually hard left channel for like piano and hard right channel is singing. And you could just sit there and turn and they would then become right in front of you. Like you wouldn't have a visual aspect, but you would just hear the music and you could stand up and turn around and they'd be behind you. And this was with any headphone you wanted. That technology, the Waves thing, they had a, a post a couple years ago about pairing up with Odyssey. 
So they're the reason why the Maxwells and all those things that have the tracking have it. They've just done a much better implementation than the Waves standalone unit was doing. Um, so do I think there's a future for it? A hundred percent. It was a little $50 thing that just has an accelerometer in it and a AAA battery. So I think it's going to happen. I don't think true audio files will ever get into it. Because I've always found if you try to force you know, stereo, pure stereo, into some environment like that, it's going to always give it a room acoustic. And it's going to sound, okay, well now it sounds like it goes into speakers. But usually speakers in an untreated room, usually speakers with a little more boom. You know, it's fun. But I think for purity's sake, a lot of people are going to sit very still, with very expensive headphones, or very expensive speakers and not move at all. But for fun, and that's like 80% of my life, yeah. I would absolutely enjoy the hell out of it. Can I add one thing? One thing to add that's again why my camera mentioned binaural recording. So I'm sure that most of you've heard of binaural recording before. They're kind of awesome. Ideally, what a spatial audio situation is doing is re virtually recreating a live binaural recording. And ideally, if a spatial audio uh, playback was perfect, it would be indistinguishable from binaural recording. So that's what we're looking for. That's the real sound yeah. stage. Yeah, that's the real sound stage. The problem is just that that doesn't work on speed. That's satiating your desire for... <laughs> you'd, have had, you'd have to have head tracking and then... All the way to the back. All the way to the, way to the cheap back. seats. Or the expensive seats. Back to DSP. I think it got it. Um, no, I was just kind of curious. Um, it's definitely not the case with all manufacturers. And I'm exactly kind of curious for your take. I know there's like some tension between manufacturers and reviewers over measurements and I was just kind of curious for your take like how do we reconcile that either I don't know just yeah curious what do you what do you guys take what's your take on that tension between reviewers using measurements and publishing them and some manufacturers feeling like they are bad for their sales or yeah, Mark asked, asking the spicy question. Yeah. Right? Read, <laughs> you read audio science review before you came here my five things with them, did you? No. Oh. Probably a mod. Well, so good reading, actually. Is, I, probably it was entertaining for me. I don't think it was very entertaining for my wife, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just very quickly on that subject. I mean, for the manufacturing side, I sit in a place where I'm like, well, I have to take all the data and then subjectively use it. And you know, you have to, when you're finishing a headphone, you have to end up in a spot where you're, you know, you can't have perfection acoustically on everything, even if you add an inductor or capacitor or resistor to the sound to get to a certain place, uh, you know, with the measurement, you're giving up impulse response or something else, or CSDs, there's always gonna be a uh, compromise somewhere in the sound. And so, you know, I know some of these guys have experience on that end too, and so it just it ends up in a place manufacturing where you're like, man, I can't please anyone. So the safest thing to do is just make something you like how it sounds, and then uh, you know go in your room and cry in the field. Okay. So um, for context, I have been measuring since uh, 2016, so we're closing in on almost 10 years of me doing all these really lines, and it has been my uh, goal to have more transparency within the industry. How that is being done, one of which would be to publish more measurements. Now, I don't think that there is the, the, the onus of publishing measurements should be on the manufacturer. Personally, that is um, it's, it's really their choice. You, I, I don't think you should vilify them for doing it. But that said, there has been a worrying trend of um, brands and manufacturers blacklisting reviewers who do measurements and I feel that is a step too far because that is limiting you know the well, one thing is the freedom of speech right and second of all is just pushing the agenda that all oh, uh, measurements we don't want measurements here we don't want measurements anywhere when again the goal should be more transparency within the industry and you know again I've been doing this for quite a while I feel like now there is the standard, the, the expectation that when a product releases, there should be measurements of that product floating somewhere. It doesn't have to be from the manufacturer, but it should be floating somewhere. And I think with the proliferation of couplers, of measurement rigs, uh, of, of anything, you know, headphones, IEMs, DAX, AMPs, whatever, it is a net positive for the company. So what was the original question that we, <laughs> that we should be doing? Yeah, but, yeah. We, there that should be silent. more measurements in, in the industry, but but at the same time. I think the question was, you were kind of saying, is it 
that kind of tension between manufacturers and reviewers, how you can reconcile that relationship. Is that yeah, so the reconciliation yeah. would be that, yeah, there shouldn't be the expectation that um, the manufacturer should be publishing. I think that just immediately just relieves the tension immediately. Uh, but again, there is also the expectation that the manufacturer should not be trying to control the narrative by withholding units in any way, because that, that has happened many times over in the last few years. So, yeah, so I feel like that's just uh, man management of expectations on both sides. Uh, basically the same as what, what Kryn said, but I did want to add one thing. Um, I, I do think that the uh, popularity of, of measurements uh, <clears throat> has definitely changed the way that a lot of manufacturers approach this. To the point where now a lot of manufacturers are actually uh, conducting their own measurements, they're buying standard measurement equipment and then showing it, they're publishing it on their site, or in some cases for IEF they're putting it on the box as part of the marketing material. And that's, again, I, I share what Kryn said where it's, I don't think the onus is on the manufacturer, but a lot of them have sort of taken it upon themselves to do that, and that th there's another benefit to that, potentially, I don't know if it's always realized, but um, because there are also so many uh, various different types of couplers and measurement rings out there, that the manufacturer's saying, uh, well, okay, why don't we just do it ourselves, put out the information ourselves, and do it right, you know, put whatever standard we're adhering to, out there in the public for the public to judge for themselves, rather than relying on people using non-standard equipment, for example, or you know DIY rigs or whatever, right? Um, and then on top of it, they're able to kind of show it relative to uh, you know basically what their targets are, rather than having people rely on, for example, those terrible reviewer targets that are out there. Um, you know, they can they can show instead <laughs> they can show instead relative to whether it's a standard target, say from Harman, or their own internal, you know, what they're testing on and what they're looking for. So that's that's kind of how I see it. Mm -hmm. So most manufacturers obviously want to make something that's very good. I don't think that's any question. Everyone wants to listen to something good too. The flip side of that is that it's very rare that a manufacturer comes up to me after I listen to something and says hey, it wasn't that good. Instead, they say, what do you think of it? And generally, what that means is, I want feedback. You know, I, Zach, I've listened to your headphones plenty of times for trade shows, and you've never ever walked up to me saying, hey, isn't that new thing really good? Don't you love it? Usually, you come up and you say, hey, what do you think about that? You just listen to it. What do you think? I just look deep into your eyes. Yeah, I mean, do we have connection just now? Is that like a moment? Um, I've had very rare cases where manufacturers have been mad at me for feedback. You know, even when it's a case where uh, a product has been just really, really terrible, I had something with the uh, Nothing, is a company that makes TWS items, and their first wireless product, I just basically dug a hole and threw them out. And then Nothing reached out after that, you know, and said, hey, you really didn't like our IEMs, how can we make them better? Did you ever had a, have you ever had a manufacturer get mad at you about the measurement specifically? Yes, it has happened in the past, but it's very rare. And I find more often than not, most manufacturers are more grateful for feedback in hopes to make a better product. The few times when they are extremely <coughs> angry about something in measurements, there's not too much you can do about it because I think that's beyond the point of rationality. So I, I think as long as anybody wants to make a better product and they're open to feedback, it's fine for open discussion. But as far as reconciling that, if someone just straight up is like, you measured my product, I hate you, it's like, well, <laughs> That's fine, I guess. You know, that doesn't seem good for the community as a whole. And I want everyone to have good audio products, but you know what? You do you, I'm sure it'll keep on selling. I think part of the problem is that people often misuse measurements. Uh, I did a seminar on this yesterday, but you know, there's a lot of people who will tell you that if a headphone does not conform exactly to the Harman curve, then clearly it's terrible, and that's what the research says. But the research does not say that, and yep. they've not read it, and they don't understand it. Uh, and the man listener at the very back of the room there uh, has actually written a fantastic article uh, on, on this sort of topic. Link in the description. Link in the description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the problem is that a lot of people are using measurements to try and find some sort of exact outcome when the reality is that the measurements should be used to describe things. Yes. Uh, there are reference variations and using measurements to try and find the things that you are going to prefer is how it should be done. But a lot of people online. Uh, seem to be very, very against that idea, even if the research itself says that that's not the case. Um, I think that manufacturers are quite right, in, unfortunately, to be a little bit worried about measurements sometimes, because uh, there, there are a lot of people who will 
you know, not to not buy something themselves, but be very vocal against something because it doesn't measure well or doesn't have the outcome that they want, even if actually it's a good outcome regardless. Um, so, oh. Sorry, I'm exactly. All my fault. Yeah. Um, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's and, and some manufacturers, I think, as, as Corinne said, go a little bit too far in blacklisting reviewers who do measurements uh, or being out, out terrified of them. I've had several manufacturers who reached out to me saying, hey, Thanks. we love your stuff, we'd love you to review our thing. Uh, and then the moment that they find out that I publish measurements, they completely stop replying to emails. Um, and that's a real shame, because someone's going to measure it anyway. Uh, and it would be better if the, there was more transparency about it. Can I lean in? Yeah, yeah. I have one more thing to say. It just came to mind. Always after you start talking, something comes back in my brain. Uh, Dr. Olive, who's you know done talk here, I'm sure all of you know, he basically created the Harmon Target, has said in a quote that and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, that the Herman target is a rough guide and approximation, not an exact target, and things are more or less going to be subjective. I have that as a sticker on my Telegram. Yeah, it's, it's a good comes, sticker. It comes in handy a lot. Um, yeah, and, and the same thing happens with source gear measurements as well. You know, a lot of people uh, trying to find a single number, ignoring a lot of other performance metrics, um, and ignoring preference completely, or what the measurements are actually telling you. Um, and my hope is that with more people hopefully getting interested in and looking at measurements and discussing it more, uh, they'll be a little bit more sort of educated. And this is you know, quite a lot of the work that we've done, um, you know, showing actual preference bounds in our measurements, not just a single line. Something as basic as that, uh, I think, can make a difference. So, right. Well, I think everyone here kind of understands my take on measurements. If you don't, it's basically this. They are absolutely required. If you are building something, you're making a DAC or an amp, you need to measure it. Is something wrong with it? you're tuning a headphone and you're going to sell it, you need to measure it. Is there something wrong? Can you fix it? The problem I have, and I had a YouTube comment, literally my, my review of the Dunu Glaciers, which are right here, lovely IEMs, love them, $1,300. One of the comments was, and this won't be verbatim because I'm not that good, but I saw the measurements, they look exactly like the variations. Mm -hmm. So obviously Zeos is just shilling because it's exactly the same IEM. And that's the problem is when people think the measurement, basically measurement fanboys, are just like, this pretty picture looks exactly like this pretty picture, they're the same. That is not the case. Yeah, but that could also be down to the differences in acoustic competes. It the could players. be that, it could be... There's a lot of things to account for. There's a hundred million things, and yeah, soundstage sure. isn't on a measurement. Would, would really strongly recommend reading Listener's article. It yeah, talks yeah. about that in great detail. It's the, really the, good. Being a fanboy of measurements is fine, but you need to understand the fine tuning of it. You have to hear both things that measure the same and then make your assessment. People that are just looking at a graph and going, I won't like this. That is not how you do this. That, the all it can be is a rough outline if you think maybe there's a treble spike, and I use, use to point at treble spikes all the time, mm -hmm. but if you've liked headphones with and IMs with treble spikes or, oh, yeah. or spikes in them. Yep. There's nothing, it, it's not a, a black and white, here's what it is, it doesn't explain. It's like a, a power graph on a Ferrari versus a power graph on a Ford. Like, they might look the same, but one is not gonna handle the same as the other. It's so a tool. It's a tool, it's a tool yeah. to measure, and it's only, I'm, I'm gonna make up some random number now, it's 28% of what's happening in an IM, the weight of the IM, the way that the nozzle comes out, that sort of stuff can't be calculated in a, in a graph. Um, I find a lot of the, the, where I would like to see more measurements is a lot of the two-channel stuff. The, the, the thing we call snake oil, where you, know, you go to a show and it's like, you have this box, you've touched this box to all these other boxes and for a measly price of $9,000, everything's better. There are no measurements provided ever with anything do you, there's no measurements ever. <laughs> the laugh in his face, he's got it, he's got something. But it's like, those are where I'd like to see more measurements. To, not disproving, I don't want to just disprove things because that's not fun. But if you have something that is actually going to make a difference, you've got a power conditioner that can show, here's what it measures, and then we unplug it, plug this in, and here's how it measures. That's perfect. I don't think you should base everything off of measurement. You still need to experience it. It's like a sunset. You can't measure a sunset and tell me if it's beautiful or not. That was very poetic. You're welcome. Um, but yeah, no. So I'm I'm for measurements for the for the creation half of things, and not anti measurement, but certainly don't rely on those to pick if you're going to like something. It's really it's really hard to explain to most subjective listeners, even yourself, because most people you're selling a piece of gear to or reviewing a piece of gear to 
haven't had the experience of having an expensive measurement rig, having the right environment, and then being able to have that gear and see where all the little changes they can hear are. And so I, you know, I know you guys are doing a really good job of explaining a lot of that stuff, but giving you know the people the, that experience so they can subjectively see it, it's a tough place to be. Yeah. 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 I, I also just wanted to add that uh, it's more so in the two channel world, uh, there are manufacturers who are you know, nervous about publishing measurements or having people measure their products because they're worried about what people might think of them. Uh, there are also plenty of manufacturers who are rightly scared of having measurements because their products do absolutely fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> we could name names, but we won't. Yeah. We should. All right. Stupid question for Z is, uh, do you want the equal $5 an hour or should I go through Patreon? Patreon, please. <laughs> they will take a fee. Subscribe Star takes a smaller fee. Yeah, just send it to you. Mine. There you go. Um, the real question is when I'm doing demos upstairs or while well, I'm auditioning different products, I don't always know what I'm listening to. Am I listening to a deck? Am I listening to you know, wiring and cables? Am I listening to just the headphones or an app? Okay. And, you know, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just start and then you can pass how off. Can, so kind of how can you figure out when you're listening to a new system when, what you're hearing and yeah, how can I mean, you break that down? That's a, that's a, there, there's a pretty easy answer to that, and I'll see if anyone else wants to chime in on this, is bring your own stuff. There's a reason the Cost KPH40 are here. It's because I know these. I know them. I know the wire they've on. I've used them for months. And I also have a source. When you come to these shows, you need something to listen to that you know and then a source to listen to on that you know, to cut out all the variation of, well, using a Denifrips deck or using <coughs> the, usually cables aren't have much as far as source cables go, but you don't want to listen to a new headphone on a new amp you've never heard on a new deck with a source on a song you've never heard. That is useless. You want to cut out 90% of that unknown and give it just what you know as far as that. That's why it's very easy to do get a million adapters and you bring a DAP and you bring a headphone or IM that you trust and then you wander from thing to thing and you you steal it from whatever they're trying to show it. A lot of times I find that um, obviously if you're showing a product here you're going to want to do the best it can but that doesn't necessarily mean if you take that product home and plug it into your stuff it's going to be the best it can. You want to experience that and they can explain that oh because you know this headphone doesn't work well on solid state only wants tubes. So that would be something you could put in the back of your mind, but you still have to know the source to really make an assessment here on this floor. I wish it was quieter. We should have like a quiet hour, like like adult swim, like the one hour. <laughs> there should be like a one hour period where everyone has to just whisper. It would be great. I think, they could, I think we could pull it off. I think New York especially would love to just shut up for an hour. <laughs> I was trying to find a dim switch on our room so it could be quieter. I feel like it's darker, people. Um, yeah, at, at shows it can be quite tricky to evaluate a single component because you often don't have a sort of chain that you are completely familiar with. And yeah, that is a problem and it's a good recommendation to try and, particularly at Can Jam where things are portable, uh, bring your own either headphones to try source gear on if that's what you're looking for, or bring your own, you know, the Komodo tube or something to run different IEMs, uh, try and make things consistent. That being said, generally speaking, uh, the, the headphones or the speakers that you're listening to are going to make the biggest difference. Most of my content is centered around source gear stuff, but the transducers are, in 99% of cases, going to make the biggest difference by far. Um, yeah, it's it's quite tricky, especially with speaker stuff in particular. You go to different shows, and people ask you, like, yeah, well, what do you think of that deck? It's like, well, I don't know. It sounded, the system sounded great, but I've never heard any of the components. I've never been in that room before. Um, with speakers, the room itself can make as big a difference as the speakers. Um, yeah, but with headphones, though, the answer is basically try and make things as consistent as possible. It's not really possible to evaluate just one thing. Um, but because of the fact that headphones are going to make the biggest difference by far, you can usually get a pretty good indication even if the headphone is on an unfamiliar chain in most cases. Yeah, Cameron said basically everything that I was going to say. If you're listening to speakers somewhere, you're listening to the speakers and the room. If you're listening to headphones somewhere, you're listening to the headphones. And some other components can make a small difference in that, but for the most part, if it sounds terrible, a $10,000 amp isn't going to make a terrible headphone suddenly turn into a good one. If you want to evaluate source gear, you need to have the same headphones, though. Yeah, if you try to find it at least a little bit, play recordings on that I've actually worked on or been in the studio for, so I know what they're supposed to sound like. But still, like, oh, it's $2,600 for a headset. 
you know, headphones from Vocal, but is it the name that's causing it to sound so wonderful, or is it? It's the headphones. It's the headphone for sure. And it, what, if you didn't read it, 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 you try to find recordings and things that you are familiar with, but that's another good thing. Listen to music that you know, because there's nothing more difficult than sitting down at a table, you want to check out a product and you're like, okay, what do they have on this iPad? I don't know oh, yeah. any of these bands. <laughs> also, you got to make sure that the streaming services have different versions of songs. Yes, yeah, you might end up with like a live version of a track and you're like, why does this sound so much more spacious? <laughs> oh, well, that would do it. I mean, yeah, basically that. You just, you have to control for whichever variable it is that you are trying to evaluate. Um, but it's the headphones. Unless we're talking about tube amps or high open beating sources, it's the headphones. <laughs> Print, you got anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I know that even the tube amp we're coming out with uh, soon, that like, we, you know, when you measure it, the drop off in dB, even though bass is like 0.75, you know, it's yeah. much less than a headphone's going to be yeah. variable. Yeah. Yeah. To the back, to the expensive seats back here. Uh, so my question for all of you is, what do you think the most dangerous misconception is that commonly exists among audiophiles? And is it the job of reviewers to try to educate people out of those misconceptions? Mm, great question, Jerry. Misconception. I mean, yeah, where are the yeah, most, dangerous dangerous most dangerous misconception. Oh, okay, so since I'm the the, the, the squiggly line guy, I guess I'll start with Harmon. Yeah, that's that's the one thing that I feel like is the most misunderstood research currently that we have. Because everyone likes to think of it as the one true curve, the one true god, right? But again, it's not. It's it's all it's an average. And sometimes when you mention the fact that it is an average, people get offended for whatever reason. But the whole point of Harmon is that there's preference bounds. There's preference. And it's, it's it's a consumer research, right? They're trying to make the best headphones for everyone. Like that's why the research is done. And the so, curve itself is really smooth. Yeah, so, so it's also happen. very smooth. Yeah. So, so they're just trying to make the best product possible. How do you do that? The, the best way is, oh, the customer is always right. How do you find out the preferences of the customer? You average it out. And again, it's fine. Everyone has their own preferences, but it has kind of turned into this big monolithic uh, <laughs> monster that everyone says like hit Harmon or die and I feel like that's no it'll be worse and it's yeah. smoothed out to what two to one three one, to one uh, one half three to one one half one half well one half it depends on which one you're actually looking at because uh, there are some that are uh, one third I've seen the one third one and then yeah. humans yeah. humans so, average hearing is nine one nine yeah one one, one, six. Six. one six one six yeah so it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. yeah so it might be worth explaining what all right, so yeah, resolve and yeah. like us, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, so typically when we're doing graphs, we we, would, we want as much data as possible. So, so we don't want to be smoothing it. If you smooth it, it means that basically all of those features, the peaks and dips and whatever else, it goes away. Um, but the problem is uh, that if you don't do any smoothing, it can actually be difficult to read the graph. And the other side of it is that human hearing doesn't like we don't hear things that way. We don't hear things completely unsmooth either. Um, so there is a bit of a like a debate about like you know, should things be smoothed or should things not be smoothed. And generally, I, I don't know if you agree, but but typically most measurement folks would say we want to show all the information, but we want to make sure that it's readable. At the same time, the targets that commonly get used from Harman are smooth to one third or one half octave, which means that they are significantly smooth, which makes sense for the type of research that they're doing because they're aiming at a broad a broader kind of average. And this is also one of the reasons why we would typically say that it's great to evaluate headphones relative to Harman target, but headphones shouldn't necessarily be tuned to match it, or neither should be, they necessarily be EQ'd to match it either. And that's because there are actually bound to be, if you look at, it, at the, at the head-related transfer function, so basically like the anatomy, human anatomy transfer function of the human ear, uh, there are all kinds of different fine-grained features, peaks and dips and things like that. Um, so ideally, you would want to not overcorrect for those things that actually exist naturally anyways. But given Harman's project, it makes sense to smooth it to one third or one half. So that's why it's good as an evaluative tool, not necessarily as a uh, you know, fine-grained tuning tool. The problem isn't the tool, it's that people misunderstand it's the analysis. Yeah, it's yeah. the analysis of the tool. 
I did have any other misconceptions? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's, let's move away. Yeah. So I had another. There was a, in my. I don't know if this is the biggest misconception, but it's maybe one that is. Uh, yeah, it's maybe not talked about enough. But people will regularly, when there's a disagreement about you know how something is heard or whether something is preferred, um, you know the the answer that people often walk away with to solve that problem is well we all just have different ears and we have different hearing and therefore you know uh, it's all just you know this big relative thing but uh, if you look at again the ear transfer functions and how measured at the eardrum uh, there are trends and there are similarities and so I would say that like even though you know people do have different preferences and as we know from that research from the preference research there are different preference groups that have been established um, at the very least it is probably good if uh, manufacturers try to tune headphones with some sort of ear transfer function in mind, or generally try to aim for what the trend of ear transfer functions would be, just so that things are, the sound that you get is going to be roughly human ear shaped for the response. That's, uh, I, th I think that that, again, it's probably not the biggest misconception, but certainly the idea that you walk away from a conversation about, you know, the different preferences that you have is, well, I hear what I hear, you hear what you hear, and then we all hear differently, and everything is okay. I, I think that's probably a misconception. I just want to know that my beanie's better than his beanie. It's true. Um, it's, not the, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, something that I think is a dangerous misconception in audio now is the overestimation of competency. And that's that competency. And so I think that all of you guys would agree that we basically like live and breathe this stuff. You, you can say skill issue. Yeah, yeah, skill issue. <laughs> I think you guys can all agree that we like live and breathe this stuff, but there is still so much more we all have to learn. Of course, yeah. Like there is a, a certain point where people will start to really like learn about audio and learn about measurements and all this stuff. And they feel like they've, you know, unlocked this whole new level and you have, but a lot of people will immediately uh, assume they just know it all right then and there. And oh, and that, the truth is, is that a lot of people, even the ones who are doing all this research, the reason why we're doing this research is because there's so much more that we don't know yet. I, I have one thing to add to that. The, the other thing is that the individual experiences that we have are not necessarily universal. That's the other side to that coin. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, there's a ton of people that will make an assumption based off of some existing knowledge <laughs> that may be incomplete and you may not realize it until years later. I know that, you know, I've been doing headphone reviews for probably about seven years now. And I think that me seven years ago was an idiot. I think that me five years ago was probably an idiot. Um, and I hope, five minutes ago? Five minutes ago, yeah. I hope that me in five years thinks that me now is an idiot. That would mean that I'm still making progress. But I think there's still always more to learn. And that's something that is not often enough understood, I think. I'll, uh, I'll move away from the sort of measurement thing for a bit and try and talk about something a little bit business oriented, uh, which is that I think uh, there's sort of a combination of two damaging misconceptions. One is that a lot of people think that something is more expensive, therefore it must be better, mm -hmm. which is very often not the case. Uh, but also people misunderstand how, especially in an industry like this, things are actually priced and how much, people, how much money people are actually making. Uh, there's a lot of people that think that some of these companies are just making money hand over fist uh, and don't understand how much cost, how many costs there are, and how few units, in some cases, uh, these costs have to be amortized over. Um, actually, to come back to the Apple Vision Pro that we mentioned earlier, that's a decent example of this causing some sort of outrage in a different market recently. Someone posted uh, basically a parts list of that product, and the total cost of all the parts to put together an Apple Vision Pro came to something like $1,700, I think it was. And so you've got a lot of people immediately going, well, clearly, it's a ripoff then. They're overcharging us massively, this is an outrage. And people completely forget that they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that particular product, to, and that has to be amortized somehow. And in an industry like this, where there can be, in some cases there are millions of dollars put into R&D for a product, and there might only be a couple thousand units. That means there's a huge amount of cost that has components to be. Components don't assemble themselves. No, exactly. Yeah, that's the other yeah. thing. The components they don't, they don't insure themselves either when they get shipped and lost. No. It's, yeah. the, the components don't assemble themselves. The engineers have to get paid. The office doesn't pay for itself, doesn't eat it itself. Uh, and you know, coming to an event like this, going and exhibiting at CanGem is not cheap. Um, and so that's one thing which I, I'd say is that people should be a little bit more aware of 
A, the fact that just because something is expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Some stuff is expensive for the sake of being expensive, but also there's a lot of quite small businesses that have expensive products, not because they are trying to scam you or make just absurd amounts of money, but because they put a lot of money into development, they put a lot of money into marketing, they come to these shows, uh, they have costs which have to be added onto these units, and that means that even if the unit only costs a couple hundred dollars to build, it might genuinely need to cost thousand or two thousand dollars for them to break even. So, yeah. I think you read off my notes here because I wrote down cost no equal better. Oh, that's <laughs> um, but that's the thing. I, I get people come to me and they say, I had this headphone, it was four hundred dollars. I want a better headphone. I have a budget now of eight hundred dollars. And I'm like, Well, what do you like? Because there could be a three hundred dollar headphone that actually helps you more, or an amp or a DAC or something that fits what you want specifically better, not necessarily because it's more expensive, but because it's just, you know, price again doesn't dictate if something's better. Taste has a lot to do with it, and you got to know your taste, which is why you come to this, because you, Best Buy doesn't have a good selection, you're not going to do the thing on Amazon where you buy nine things and return eight. Um, Excuse me, they have the full Beats lineup, actually. They do have the full Beats lineup at uh, Best Buy. Um, but to, to go on to more of, so, um, so yeah, I will rec I will, had someone who came to me and was like, I have $900 to spend on a headphone, I had this one, I like it. There's a $200 headphone that does exactly what you want. Don't be fixated on you have to spend eight. Spend two, take that 600, put it in the bank, do something else with it. It's fine, just make sure you enjoy the music, especially with music. I don't think anybody here, maybe besides us, has to listen to music to live. Like, like, like you could just stop and you'd still be fine. You're not a surgeon, you're not, not a surgeon that needs a tool. you like, I enjoy music. So it's a hobby, you know, you want to spend as, <laughs> what? What's funny? I, me and DMS just will have the same look of fear on our face at the same yeah. time. <laughs> music is a hobby we should all enjoy. If you're a music producer, if you're the one that's in the studio and you're, you, you have millions of people that are going to buy this and everyone's livelihoods riding on the middle of it, you kind of have to listen in the proper way. But we're all here to have sort of fun. You want to when you make headphones, do you want to enjoy them? Wow, that takes way too long. That was way, way too long to answer that question. <laughs> I, I usually hope that if I enjoy it, someone else, but I, I can't worry about it, so I, I just stop when I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, uh, stopping you when know, you're happy better is... better or worse, I, you know, screwed either way. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it comes down to, you know, you find the groove, and the groove could be in mid-fi. I don't know, where, where does mid-fi end for you guys? What, what's, what's, your, what's your line? That's, that's my question. Price, though. cost line? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've heard people say that $1,000 headphones are mid fi. And mid I'm. Mid fi these days is like five grand, I think, right? It, it, <laughs> yeah, I am, I am certainly not into that thing. So it, that was like. There's I, only I, one fi hi fi set up here and it costs $108,000. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the only hi fi thing. But going back to what Cameron was talking about, where the cost of a product matters. And I've, I've and you're going to hate me for this. People who know are going to hate me for this. I've actually tried to convince some smaller creators to up their prices because they're trying they explain to me what things cost and they're like well if I do this it'll cost me then I get this chassis for 500 I should charge $900 I'm like so you're going to try to make 19% profit on this but what if one gets lost in the mail what if one gets damaged and catches on fire or you need to be able to sell a product and then have another one completely evaporate and you still have something there, some form of profit, so that you could continue making reliable headphones without going into bankruptcy. So, yeah, you you see things here for fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, if there's a huge company, Samsung will probably make infinite profit because they just have a hundred million, hundred thousand workers. But the small guy has to protect himself, his investment. He's got to pay the insurance. He's got to pay the bills. So it's gonna be. If you take apart a, a unit and say, well, I could build this for $61, go ahead. And then mark every minute and hour it takes for you to gather the parts, solder it, put it together, and then imagine trying to market it, ship it, and insure it. And it's like, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. But why are you gonna charge you know, $2,000 for this and not 500? So yeah, I think that's enough for that when one. You, when you look at the uh, accounting sheet of, uh, of, of like, you know, Every month I get it from my accountant, what the business has and everything. You, you know, the cost of the goods sold, the parts is like this little five section thing. And then all the costs of, you know, 
running the business, it's like, you know, 60 sections of rent and this and that. I'm like, oh my God, we, we had to buy food for everyone this day. So it's, it, it gets very complicated. Very fast. Okay. It's a poor camera. Potentially spicy question. Pick one reviewer on the table and tell them one way that they could improve their reviews. <laughs> but, 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 you first. Uh, <laughs> this is bullshit. Um, Wait, can, can we say that about YouTube? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm not on the table. Oh. You'll have to say that out um, but, 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 there are restrictions. You can't come for Zeus' waifus. And you, oh, and, you can't come, and you can't cover Cameron's Britishness. <laughs> Beans! <laughs> so saucy, so spicy. It's just starting to heat up and we only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep them short. Yeah. I'm still thinking. Put it, put it somewhere Who's first? Who is first? first? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Golden's out. Mine's a bit of a softball. But Zeo's, mine would just be basically having slightly shorter videos. I enjoy your videos. I just, I very rarely have time to be able to watch like a nearly hour long review. The I am reviews are all under 20 minutes. Does, okay. does Zeos put chapter things in his I videos? I do, I, obsessively. <laughs> I watch myself at 2x. It's like watching a chipmunk version of me. It's great. <laughs> Zeos, any rebuttal? Uh, no, no, I want to make them shorter. It's just hard to do because I got so much to say. Um, so I got to fix somebody? Alright, well, here's the thing. I don't actually watch other reviewers. That's a thing. I do not. I don't want to get their opinions. I don't want to care about their style. I don't want to say, did you see what DMS's new camera looks like? It was color correction. I don't care. Although, <laughs> they, I need to go shop about it, so I, that's why I know it has it. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, so I'm just going to, I'm going to throw a little ball. It's going to be for, for DMS, because he actually, I haven't watched some of his videos. You seem way too excited for everything. It's so much like, fun. Like, you hate like, I really hate this. Or, like, I really love this. Or, oh my god. Like, just calm down. You want to see a sadder DMS. <laughs> <laughs> no, my thing is, I think he's not a sad person, but you know what? Could you do a sad letter review for me? Do you want to like, fuse us in the one yeah. word? Yeah. 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 You guys could do it like every other word in a review. Yeah, that, was <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> On that note, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> well, these guys I work together. Really There's this incredible thing in the modern age of digital video and film called color. Yeah, I know. Oh, I knew this is coming. Just try and join. Okay. That's all I've got. It's a big fan of the black one. Alright, mine is for Zeos. Oh. Fewer waifus. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. Yeah, I'm talking about it now, it doesn't matter. But, my. <laughs> all right. my, thing, my thing is for Zeos. Do some mental measurements. Uh, no, 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 I was going to say that. Come on. <laughs> That would require I'm surprised I didn't get hit, honestly. Hmm. I, I don't watch videos, I don't know. Yeah, 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 no. So here's the thing. I don't I, I I follow the same thing as yours. I don't watch like reviews because I don't want to entertain my every my you know, thoughts. But if there's one thing that I can say is no, actually I can't. Because I wanna say like, oh like headphones.com can be more entertaining, but it's like <laughs> it's it's a style. You know, it's just a niche. Ah, right? I mean, feel it. That's <laughs> all three of them. You're having a fun. Yes. Grin found the like, so this. Like, this is entertaining, but then again, it's like we disagree, but uh, disagreements are fine. So I don't want to roast him for disagreeing for me. So for me, it's a safe, global answer is DMS. I hate the widescreen. Please don't do it. Four by three. Perfect. I love it. Now it's, now it's retro. Just don't stop the 24 yeah. FPS. Yeah, no diffusion. I tried 4 3. Oh, no diffusion filters. Uh, yeah, I tried 4 3. 4 by 3. 4 p No! <laughs> <laughs> I worked so hard to get it up shooting 4K. Come on. Right, that's it. Oh, the listener, you should, uh, we have to give one to the listener also, because he's not, that, he's the reviewer in the back who asked this question, so it's not very relevant. Did it do it again? You should be Why did you break my thing? I have one. Um, it's for Why? That owes me a $500 camera. Oh. Yeah, and this is something is it, is it 2040p target? No. I gotta figure out what. <laughs> um, he likes it's very slanted, warm so anytime I touch it. Right, I finished my water, so. Uh, Joel brought this up yesterday, and it was a really insightful point, I think. We do a lot of man talking to camera. We should show the product more, and it being used more, and it being measured more. That's a good point. Yes, I point. do everything but the measurement part. 
He's very good at showing the product. Zeos invented the camera on face. I, I, my new camera, you actually you can actually see it now because I, I switched to the DJI, so you can actually go like here. So yeah, you actually get to see it. I never wanted to be famous. I, here, look at that. I was gonna say you're just talking. I never wanted to be a YouTuber. I just wanted to give my opinion on the internet, which is a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, no, I I didn't want to be famous. I just don't want to show my face. I want to show the product, but it's hard when you're doing what you're doing. Which is like, hi, I am Cameron. Actually, what do you, how do you introduce yourself? And those deals, didn't we just like see your face on the internet like a couple months ago or something? May. <laughs> yeah, so. It's been a year. Zios, yeah. We bullied him into it at Munich. Yeah. It, it was just a matter so I could do these shows and not have to worry about it. And uh, hopefully get some starstruck ladies out there, posse out there, maybe. <laughs> um, we just see a hand. Yeah. Like yeah, there's a hand. <laughs> He's hiding behind all the audio files. Um, oh, what are we talking about now? Oh, yeah, hold on. Another question. Wrong. We only have a few more minutes, I think. Yeah, we got we got me right there. I was curious. Um, on your like personal time, like besides from like your reviewing time, like what IEM or headphone or possibly stickers get like the most uh, listening time? Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Very easy answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no. All right, I'm not gonna shoot my own product, but yeah, KH one twenty seven fifty subwoofer. Um, I do have HDK 100 specifically for this call calls. I'm very privileged, I know. And uh, I am outside. Honestly, I use a lot of AirPods Pro 2s because it's just convenient. Sometimes with Galaxy Buds too. But um, if you're talking about wire irons, yes, my own product. I'm not going to show. <laughs> Despite the fact that IEMs are objectively worse than over your headphones, as we know, as those we all goddamn know, videos, as we all know, uh, yeah, 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 I know that facts. Uh, I've been listening. I listen mostly to the Truth Gear Hex, um, and it again it would be the High Senior Mega Fest, and so it will probably be that once I'm able to get one. But that that's it, basically. The High Senior Mega Fest for my <laughs> IEM. <laughs> And then for my headphone, um... Is that enough Barrett? Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> what? I was gonna say Atrium. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Atrium. Yeah, not Vapor. This guy! He's doing it at the same time. Yeah, so it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's, it's, it's been a long weekend. Yeah, the yeah. CMF Atrium is my like, go-to every single day headphone that I put on. If it's not that, it's the HD6XX. But almost always Atrium. So. What speakers? Oh, speakers. oh. Speakers? I actually got rid of almost all... I had like a bajillion speakers, like Magnapans and all these other... I got rid of... Everything and now I just use the JBL 306P Mark II and I just corrected them to the room. They're like three hundred dollars for a set of speakers. That's all I need anymore. I'm very happy. Um, yeah, for headphones for me, the, the one that gets the most headtime is the uh, the Mavatrum. I absolutely love that thing. Zach's done a fantastic job. Stop it. <laughs> With um, if I'm really wanting to like sit down for sort of an hour or so and just listen critically, I'll use my speakers. I've got a pair of Focal Super Number Threes, uh, which I like a lot. Um, but yeah, for headphones, Atrium, and then if I'm listening to electronic stuff, I'll usually switch to an Abyss 1266 because it's wonky as hell, but just works. That bass. That bass. That bass. I'm staring at the floor because I have so many options, and I usually, if I'm just at home alone, I will not listen to headphones unless I'm doing a mixing of my sound demos, which are still available, but they're private. So I'll have NDH20s and Neumanns. And they're, not, they're the most uncomfortable headphones you'll ever wear, but I trust them for doing the, the sound demos. Um, isn't it for, the, for you, isn't it the SHP9500? No. Not anymore? No, no. it got replaced with the JT1 recently. I'm sorry. When I first you. met you, Zios, that's, you brought that to a meet, the Well, the Shift 9500 should have been, absolutely still should be respected to this day. Except for Respect the, your uh, granddad. Okay, KPH30i. Aren't those the ones? Okay, well, KPH40s are the now are the, the, the ones. But that's the thing is, if I'm leaving the house and I'm taking an IM with me, I, I don't, what am I taking? What am I taking? Oh my God, I'm, I'm blanked. I'm blanked out because it's like, I have so many options. I think honestly, speakers are my preferred method. If I could review infinite speakers, you know, 15 times a month, I would do that. And right now, I most look forward to, I have a, a, a set of Monacoustics, which is a Korean loudspeaker company, which Nathan, <laughs> you could tell the one other person in the room who's heard them. Um, they're all aluminum and they're like six grand and like I can't wait to sit in front of them because they don't exist. Like, they have no flavor. There's zero. I just sit down and it's like, oh, music's playing and then nothing else is happening. So I don't know. I, I was actually so looking forward to hearing them that I actually 
I have to go back and redo the video, so don't worry about it. But I rushed through the, like, the Triangle Antal 40th anniversaries. The beautiful $5,000 speakers. I'm like, okay, these are fine. Back to these. So I'm, I'm a speaker guy, so I will probably be looking forward to hearing any numbers of speakers, more so than a headphone or even an IEM. Um, but if I'm out and about, it's kind of hard to carry giant speakers around and play them. So, oh uh, God, what the hell is IEM? Screw it, I'm going to print myself JoJo's. Love my JoJo's. That base. That Anything base. you guys want to finish with? Anything you guys didn't say you want to say? You want us to finish each other, finish each other off on? Jesus Christ. <laughs> God, yeah, I have fine. to. <laughs> Zio's soul finish out. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so I guess um, best to show or most surprising to show, I'll just pass it down. I like that like Fio K19. That thing was sweet. Did you what's, see that? What's the, is it a, it's a DAC amp, DAC but it, it, it's it, it's a tall one, and yeah. it's marketed for like studio. It's like a cube thing. No, 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 not the cube. No. It's it's a skinny like book, but it has it has a separate USB port to do DSP like, for the whole hardware. Bio K19. Yeah. All right. Eight watts a channel. Right. You need you need one in your room. Gold sound. Any other products to mention? Uh, the Orbis Acoustics. Oh god, I can't. Sierra. Sierra, that's the one. Orbus Acoustic Sierra. Sierra, yeah. It's going to be under thousand dollars. He's achieved the tuning using a combination of the actual physical stuff and a passive filter, and <laughs> he does a really good job. Cool. I like that a lot. You put this on. Hi, Senior Omega Five EST. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay, okay. We okay. end up right yeah. where we started. I will say though, I actually, I, I brought that with me. It wasn't actually the show, but something at the show Ooh. I really enjoyed. Wanda, 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 Wanda. That was really good. Wanda was good. Because he's not going to plug himself. His deck is great. We should talk about the uh, growl. And your Boca Open. I should really like that. Thank I haven't heard of Boca. Sub $1,000 EMF. Makes me very happy. Not a good Maybe one day. <laughs> the close is amazing. Boca close is great. All right, I'm going to say it. My favorite thing that I heard the show is the dusk. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. But I didn't hear that much. Right? <laughs> is that a critical dusk? It was yeah. that one Well, eventually. Maybe some of us don't know exactly. Eventually, we'll be winning. Maybe some of us don't know exactly. Yeah. Sorry, who's that? Capra Audio. Capra Audio. Capra Audio. Capra Audio. Alright, shout out to Capra Audio. So, like, that's the. There were some really nice. That is, yeah, interesting. It's like you can finally build your own headphones. You have a schematic for that. And if you have a 3D printer, you can just have at it. And that's to me. It's a DIY project. Who heard the growl? But it's like a proper one where it's like you don't have to pay for 30 minutes in a or, you know, injection mode plastic. Those, uh, those bamboo printers are yeah. great. Yeah. You can get those yeah. things. Everything it was done. just perfect. Yeah, so to me, it's like that's a very yeah, interesting that, thing yeah. that, um, you know, has been teased to me for quite a while. I, don't I haven't actually that. tried that's until right. now. And now that I've tried it, it's like, yeah, this is legit. Like, wow. Which ones did you try? Um, like, which of what you know, The Hanamami, the both of them, as well as the cap, the Capra ones that uh, I thought was slightly too basic, but I, I saw the potential. That was like, okay, like, that could be the really good. You know, no, the, 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 the coaxial yeah, yeah, yeah. ring radiator. Oh. interesting as well. I didn't know you could buy something like that off of AliExpress. Yeah, but soon I'll like it as well. So she'll live. Alright, well, thank So she'll live. Alright, well, thank